learning to be still. It seems like it goes hand in hand with what she was talking about earlier. At least I think it is. Learning to be still. And um, sometimes when you think about being still, when you think about uh, somebody telling you, just wait, just be calm, just be still. It sounds like you don't want to do anything at all. Really, what it is, is that you're allowing God to begin the process, begin working on something. And then, as you see him in action, you see him working, you start becoming more in tune with what he's doing. I'm not sure what that is. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, learning to be still. Uh, this is, comes from Psalms 107, beginning with verse 27 through 30. I, I like to use different uh, translations, some, some of them modern. I don't use the King James anymore. I used to use it. Uh, I prefer the New King James, but I also like, like this one here, the New Living Translation. Uh, look at what it says here, and it kind of describes a lot of people when they're really depressed and anxious and not really sure what they're doing. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits end. Lord, help me, they cried in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He cal calmed the storm to a whisper and he stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Isn't that a wonderful thing? When I read that many years ago, it really calmed me down, you know. Um, and, and I think we all need to be calm, don't we? we? We all need to realize that there are some things that are going to affect us. There are some things that are going to make us worry. And if, if, if everything's going right right now, just remember eventually something is going to go wrong. You know, it always happens like that. And I think that God doesn't really spare us from problems. Rather, he uses the problems to teach us that he's in charge, he's in control, and that he's going to make this right. And all you got to do is just kind of take your sweet time and let him start acting. And it's kind of hard and it's kind of difficult to do because the first thing we want to do is we want to take over. We want to take charge. We want to get more involved. So as we as human beings have a tendency to react quickly to our problems, don't we? We want to react quickly. We want to do something. And if you're not doing something, then maybe you either don't care or you don't know what's going on or maybe uh, you're just confused or scared or something, you know? But that's not the way it works. God wants us to take a moment, to pause for a moment and wait on him. And sometimes we feel that we have to do something to resolve things on our own. We don't want to wait. We want to just do it and do it now. You know, a lot of times your first reaction will be the wrong reaction. Sometimes we, we, um, we do what we do without really thinking about it. It's like more desperation, you know, more anxiety, as they say. Well, this is a practical in most of the ordinary routine things we face. And we're talking about routine things. You know, we're not talking about, I mean, like me, say, for example, I'm working on a com computer. I know what I need to do. You know, I need to what to fix, you know. And, and if um, uh, maybe Albert over there is working on a, a, a uh, uh, some furniture or something, you know, uh, he doesn't have to wait. He just does it, right? But what we're talking about here is what if, what if, you, what if you get sick? What if you get injured? What if you lose your job or something, you know? What if um, you run out of money? What if a, a, some 
um, something out of the ordinary comes about, some emergency that you weren't ready for. You know, and I think most of us know that a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck. They don't really have anything set aside, you know, in case something goes wrong. But when God is providing you a little extra, I've noticed it's because something is going to happen. <laughs> something is coming up. So you need to set that aside. You know, so it, it's like somebody saying, well, we're going to give you more food today for a reason. And then instead of eating it all, we maybe we just set some of it aside, right? And if, if you're getting extra money that the Lord has provided, maybe the Lord is preparing you from difficult times. Isn't that what we lo learned from Joseph, remember? How he was telling people, or rather he was telling Pharaoh that he needed to set aside uh, you know all the plenty that he was getting for the for the famine that was coming you know and that's how we learn those things we learn to trust god and we learn to see what he's doing and how he's operating don't wait until everything goes bad when everything really gets out of hand before you start trusting in god and doing something ahead of time but there are things that happen about which we simply can do little, if anything, about. And that's, we've been there. We've been there. Um, Martha lost her, her sister recently, as you know. And um, the first thing her husband could do was to call her, you know, because she was her only kin that was left. You know, her only, her only sister, her only family. He told her about it, but you could. T Martha said that he was very desperate about it, very, very, sh you know, shook up about it because she just laid down and went to sleep and never woke up. What do you do about those things? You, you, you know, there. What we're saying here is like a something, a case like that. And some of us have lost people, haven't we? You know, I lost my parents. I lost uh, two of my sisters. One a couple of years ago. I actually lost three sisters now that I think about it. And it's always hard. It's never easy. But I tell you that if you are not strong spiritually, when these storms of life happen, you won't be able to handle them at all. Uh, I know Martha was really distraught about it, you know, the beginning, but she, she, she really got through it pretty well. You know, and I have to say I was proud of that. And I've been there. I've been there. It's not easy at all to, to, to do. Sometimes we got, and some of us might have family members that we're not really sure how well off they are health-wise either, right? A lot of things going on nowadays, you know. Uh, there are at times where we tend to toss and turn about in our beds. We can't sleep. Why? Because you keep worrying and thinking about the future instead of trusting in the God that is already in the future and he knows what's going to happen. And he's going to use whatever is necessary to make things right. And it's hard to, to trust a God you can't see, isn't it? Uh, but I'll let you in a little secret that some of you probably already figured out. God is not a God we see, but a God we feel. When I, I'm praying and I have a difficult time, because I've had some difficult times, I had some health issues. We, we got COVID to top it off. We went to, we went to Oklahoma, you know, to bury her sister, and we came back with COVID. My I mean, fault. that was rough, you know. No, it was not your fault. I mean, who knows? We might have got it from everybody else over there. Everybody got sick after a while. The point is that things are going to happen, you know, no matter what you do. Uh, the one thing that we did that was proactive, I guess, and we've talked about it in church here, is we try to build up our resistance, right? Not just physically, but spiritually as well, so that we are able to get over this illnesses. So yeah, I'm I'm still getting over it. You know, uh, I'm not sick anymore, and um, <clears throat> sometimes I get a little 
uh, throat pr problem there. But you know, other than that, I've been I've been tested when I go to school, and they don't see any any problems anymore. And this is after I got my vaccination. So don't let anybody kid you. I got my vaccinations, and I still got sick. You know, so here we are. But there are things that spoil our appetite sometimes, make us depressed with worry. You know, I know some people that don't. You know, when they get depressed, they eat too much. It's the opposite, isn't it? Where most people that get depressed, they don't want to eat. But, you know, not everybody's the same, right? Not everybody's the same. And so we try to be the best person we can be. And God understands us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So let's ask seven questions. Um, I think I think one of the other things you probably figured out by now is I love to use the number seven because the good Lord has used it many times. And every time I see those seven things that are going on there, I, I try to bring them out, you know. So let's ask ourselves seven questions about whether we have learned to be still and wait upon God. OK. Number one, what do you tend to do when th things go wrong? Well, it's you can find it in the Bible because these people, Israel, you may ridicule them. You may say bad things about them, but you know what? They're just like us and we're just like them. Isaiah 30, 15 to 16 says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel has said, in turning away from your sin and in rest, you will be saved. Your strength will come by being quiet, by trusting, but you would not. You said, no, we will go away on fast horses. We're going to run away, right, from our problems. We're going to run away in our fast horses. And so he says, so you will go away in a hurry and you say, we will go on fast horses. So those who come to take you will be fast. They will catch you, catch up to you. But this this little analogy here is not about riding horses. It's about running away from your problems. That's what it's about. And when you run away from your problems, you are not waiting. You have this voice inside of you that is constantly worried and angry and upset, you know. So he says, be quiet and trust. It's not like you're yelling and doing carrying on. Haven't you gotten a voice in your head that just keeps constantly saying, saying, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, what can I say? Oh, this this person here is very terrible. And if I could just get away from that job or if I could just get away from that person or if I could just get away from this house, everything would be so much better. But God says, no, your strength is to be still and wait on the Lord. Yeah, sometimes we run away from our problems, don't we? We would run away from our jobs, from our relationships, from our marriages. Like that, and we've been married for a forty plus. It was about forty six. Forty. If I lost track here. Forty eight years this year. Okay, I'm glad somebody's keeping score. But I, but um. And when I tell people that, they just look at me, how do you do it? How is that possible? And I said, you need to have a lot of patience. You need to really wait on the Lord. Because it's not always going to be right. It's not always going to go smooth at all. If you run away from it, it's, it's never going to get fixed. You say, well, you know, the next guy will be better. <laughs> The next wife will be better. No, they'll be just as bad. They'll have other issues. But they'll it, you then you want to run away again. What why, why do you notice that there's a lot of these we were talking about these inter entertainers, right? Because that they've been they they uh, they average uh, a marriage uh, will average about a year or two. You know, that's about it. That's all they can handle. Then they just throw them out. 
But the Lord says that if we choose to run, our problems will follow us wherever we go. I'm going to leave this job because I don't like these people. And you go to the next job and guess what? There's people just like the people we left behind. You know, it's true. Well, I'm going to I'm going to leave this environment because I, the next environment is going to be better. And God says, no, your strength is to wait and be quiet and trust and I will deliver you. It's kind of like. Uh, uh, you know, I've been working at my job about 22 years, you know, and I'm I'm really thinking about retiring, except that it's too much fun. And I get to play with my computers for excuse and I get to tell Martha, I really need that computer, Martha, you know, because I'm still working. And I, and I am, you know, but the truth of the matter is that I've been at this for a long time. And do you think I, it's always been easy? No. And it's been this, this last two years have been the hardest years of my career. Because we got to deal with uh, COVID. We got to deal with san sanitation. We got to deal with the laws. We got to deal with people getting sick. We got to deal with all kinds of issues. Can you imagine? I had to go every day that I went to school last last term. They would swab your nose and they would make you wait there for a while. And then you go to another place. They would give you your temperature check. It gets old after a while, you know, and then they they check you. They, they put a scanner. I don't know what the scanner is doing, but it checks all your body there. And uh, but they never found anything. Then I went on Christmas break and got sick, so. I guess they missed that one. But anyway. Are you like these people? That have look look back in your past. Where you've run away. I want to run away and I want to get away from this person. I want to get away from this job. I want to get away. From, have you been that person? Just remember God had already planned to make some things work. But you know what? Sometimes God doesn't want us where we are either. And that's true, isn't it? Sometimes God doesn't want us where we are and he makes us uncomfortable there. And then we get to realize maybe when you see another open door. Oh, OK, and then I guess I'm, suppo I'm supposed to move on now. But don't jump to conclusions. Wait a little bit more. Question two, do you get angry when things go wrong? There's some people that can lose their temper, right? They get very upset and then they start to fighting with people. Psalms 37, 7 to 9, rest in the Lord and be willing to wait for him. Do not trouble yourself when all goes well with the one who carries out his sinful plans. Stop being angry, he says. Turn away from fighting. Do not trouble yourself. It leads only to wrongdoing. Do not, and it says, for those who do wrong will be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord will be given the earth. In another version might say, and, and, uh, and the meek will inherit the earth, right? And I think we studied that. I, maybe we need to clarify it even more. You know, in one of the studies that Stan brought, nobody goes to heaven. The, the Bible never says that. He says you're going to inherit the earth. What are you going to be doing up in heaven? You know, where when God is here, He's going to He's going to reign on the earth. So I want to be where He is. Is what I'm thinking. Anyway, so He says, stop being angry. Stop fighting. When somebody gives you, you know, you know, uh, somebody put out a, a Facebook, what they call them memes, you know, I'm not even sure where they come up with that term. But it says, um, when people are mean to me, I get even. And he said it very proudly. That isn't what the Bible is saying. We get angry and then we get even. Is that what they say? We think it's unfair that the wicked seem to always get away with things. You know, they won't get away with everything. 
you and I are not promised a life here of riches and wealth and prosperity. We are promised an eternal kingdom. And isn't that much better? Getting back to my sister-in-law, you know, there's two different ways you're looking when you when you lose a loved one. And I'm just thinking about her right now. And I told Martha this morning, I was thinking about her this morning because I put on my little pin here. Can anybody tell what that is? You can't really tell from there, right? Praying hands. Well, the, they're praying hands. You have better eyes than anybody else, I guess. Uh, but she always says, I was lucky when you put on the little bird on your on your lapel, she would say. He said, well, I hate to tell you, Becky, but this is not a bird. Those, these are praying hands here. And she goes, oh, OK, sorry about that. And so I've been thinking about her today. You know, maybe the Lord got me to put this on so that I could think about her. But when you think about people like her that have been faithful to the Lord all their lives and they raise their children in a godly environment and they brought their grandchildren into the church and had them marry godly wives, you got to say, don't feel sorry for her. Sorry, be sorry for ourselves. Here we just gotta put up with our bills. We gotta put up with illnesses, the uncertainty of this administration that we're dealing with, and so forth and so on. She gets to inherit eternal life. She gets to see her loved ones. She gets to see the Lord. Isn't that better than what we have? Don't feel sorry for her. Uh, I'm sure she feels sorry for us. You know, we're we're feeling sorry for her, but she's feeling sorry for us. All oh, those guys are really messed up over there, but we're having a great time over here. But anyway, ask yourself this. Do you think they people that are evil that give you a hard time? Do you think they have peace? I have peace. They look like they're getting away with murder. They look like they're enjoying themselves but they're not and are you letting them rob you of your peace do you sit around and try to figure out what you need to do or do you wait on the lord and allow him to still your mind and your heart so you can see where god is leading you it's not always clear you know i wish it was it's not always clear but, you know, I, I one of the other reasons that I continue teaching is because I'm still blessed to to uh, be able to minister to some of my students. You know, uh, some people don't like that. I do that, but it's on them. All I do is I put in my biography that when they start looking up what teacher they're going to take. And one of my biographies is that I'm an ordained pastor still. In fact, my license was renewed recently and um, I've been, I even got a chance to talk to Brother Chip at the burial. And um, we're going to invite him over once we get a few more people in here. We'll invite him over and uh, let him do uh, the welcoming of the church and so forth. But the point is here is that we, we don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to have all the answers. And some people think I ought to have, have all the answers. If you got a problem, you just go dump it on me and I'm going to come up with a solution. I'm just I'm still looking for answers myself. So let him still your mind and your heart and calm yourself down. Question three, what is God's advice that is so often overlooked? Jeremiah 616 in God's word translation this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. You know what, what that means, right? You're at a, when you're at a crossroads, should I go left? Should I go right? Should I go backwards? Should I go forward? I'm stuck here. You know, I got to make a choice. So he says, when you stand at the crossroads and look, ask. So he doesn't say take the left or the right. He says, ask. Which paths are the old reliable paths? Ask which leads to blessings. Live that way and find a, racing, a resting place for yourself 
But you said that you wouldn't live that way. And that's the problem with Israel. They wouldn't live that way. Jeremiah was often referred to as the weeping prophet. I feel so sorry for Jeremiah, you know, because nobody would listen to him. And God would say, you know, he would tell God, God, they, they don't listen to me. I tell them everything and they still won't listen to me. He says, your job is not to make them listen. Your job is not to convert them or change them. Your job is to tell them the truth and what they do with it. I will judge them later for that. So he needed to tell these people. Look, you know, before you're going to make you when you're in the crossroads where you've got to make a decision, he says, ask, ask, you know, for good counsel, ask the Lord, which is what is the best way to go? People tend to say that sounds too simple, that sounds too easy. And so they look for other solutions to their problems. No doubt that Israel must have had a lot of worries and concerns that must have taxed their souls. You know, if you were to look at everybody's steps in life, you wouldn't see them going from this point to that point in a straight line. No, you would be seeing, oh, no, wait, this way. No, wait, what was I thinking? Let me go this way. You would see them going all over the place. And that's exactly what happened to Israel. For 40 years, they were trying to make the promised land, even though, have you ever looked on the map where Israel is and where um, Egypt is? They're neighbors. Took them 40 years to go next door. The problem is that that's the way we are. We stumble, we stagger, we move around, and we never get there, you know, and we take forever to get there. And I think a lot of us, including myself, have not always arrived at the right place at the right time. But these people rejected resting in the Lord as a remedy. They wanted to get active. They wanted to do stuff. Have you been thinking that the word of God is out of date? That was a good point that um, Cynthia was making earlier. They were thinking that it's a lot of people to believe that the word of God is out of date. It's no longer valid. Uh, I asked a, a Mormon a person that I was working with, and I said, do you guys have prophets, don't you? He says, yeah, we have our own uh, modern day prophets. And, he, and I said, have you ever, have you ever seen a conflict between a modern day prophet and of an old time prophet, you know, like Ezekiel, Elijah, Isaiah, and so forth. And he says, yeah, sometimes that happens. And what do you do? He said, well, we go with the modern day prophet because they're smarter. And the other ones, the ones in the Bible, they're out of date. I said, what? I mean, that is blasphemy. This isn't this the last uh, uh, warning in, in Revelations? Anybody that takes away or adds unto this this uh, word, their name will be taken out of the book of life. But that's what what he said. I said, does anybody else think that way? He says, oh, we all say that. I said, sometimes he says, sometimes the the um, you know the, our leaders come up with ideas that are very different. That are out of, and they said. This one's out of date, we're taking this one out. I said, man, that's terrible. Modern solutions for this old world. Yet, what does the Bible say? Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. It's all the same stuff, it just looks different. Question four, have you learned to be still? Everybody talks about that. But this is one of the hardest things that you as a believer has to do. Psalms 46 verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Just knowing that God is God and whatever he says is true. He said, you know, he often says, 
I'm not a man that I can give a word and take it back. There is no error in the word of God. John 14, 15 to 17 says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate. Who will never leave you. Who is this advocate? It's, it's some a go between, right? And, and like, like a lawyer, right? He is a Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The word cannot receive, the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So I underline that, and there's a reason for, for underlining that. You remember in the old days where we saw people like Saul, King Saul, remember that? He would be prophesying, he says, oh, and they would say, is King Saul one of the prophets now? He's prophesying. Wow, what's this? Boy, man, he was full of the Holy Spirit, wasn't he? And then later on, he disobeys God. And then he loses his kingdom. What happened there? And then we saw David having so much faith and confidence in God that he was able to fight Goliath. But then he goes and, and commits adultery. He kills this woman's husband because it doesn't look right to be me for me to be with this woman that's still married. So let's kill off her husband. And now it, she's a widow, so it's okay. There's a lot of hypocrisy in that, you know. How could the same guy that has so much faith and confidence in the Lord suddenly turn against him. And I think I arrived at the answer. Because when I compare the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know what I've seen there? The Holy Spirit lived with them, but he wasn't in them. So, Jesus said, uh, in, the, in the New Testament, or rather, John the Baptist said, he said, behold, there some, someone comes behind me that will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And he will always be with you. And Jesus said, just as he said here in John, he will be in you. And that means that he's not lo no longer hanging out with you. He's no longer uh, visiting with you where he comes and goes. No, he's going to be living in you. And that's the question we need to ask. Does the Holy Spirit live with you or in you? That's the big difference. Because if he lives in you, you will be still and calm. But the problem is for most people, the Holy Spirit is only some a friend that comes and goes. And, and I, I know that Cindy was talking about that. And I remember when, when we baptized her as well. That she really wanted the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you remember that conversation we had. She, you really wanted the Holy Spirit and say, yeah, he, he will come with you, but you need to ask. And um, there are some people that they didn't, they didn't like that when I baptize people, I would tell them, are you ready to receive the Holy Spirit? I always ask that question. Are you ready to receive the Holy Spirit so he can live in you? You know what happens when he lives in you? You get the wisdom that you've been lacking. You get the patience that you, that you don't always have. You get the calmness and stillness. You get a lot of other things that have been missing. And when God allows him, he calls him a person. When he comes, he says, it's like a person, you know, and he's living inside you. And sometimes when I am not, when I'm not always right with God, you know, and we have some very bad days, don't we? People get you upset. People give you a hard time. You get your problems and so forth, and you grieve the Holy Spirit. And the, the, the Holy Spirit's inside you, and he's hurt just as much as you do. 
And that's the time that you ask God, as I have, to strengthen your inner man, your Holy Spirit, so that God can calm you down, can give you peace. So we need to remember that God is still God. He's still in control. And he has a part of him living in us. He simply says that we need to do, all we need to do is to be still and to acknowledge that God is still here. That even the heathen are no match for him. So it's not so much what we're going to do, but what God will do if we wait on him. And sometimes he takes his time. Sometimes he really does. And I, I was discussing this with uh, Stan and Cynthia earlier that as we try to build a new church, it takes a lot of patience. It really does. Uh, I don't think when I first started, I may not have been as patient as I am now. And we, we started with a handful. It took a while to build it up, you know, and we will be doing that. We will be working with people, reaching out to them as well. Don't want to really take anybody from any other congregation. What I'd like to do is get people that are not really have a, 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 a home that or a family, because that's what we are. We really are. We if uh, not everybody has a family that they can say that they're always there, you know. And uh, in fact, I, I was looking at some people that are good Christians and living in our area that say, well, we visited this church and we visited that church. You know, I mean, visiting is one thing, but actually becoming part of a church is not the same thing at all. So it takes patience to do that. And I have the patience to do that. But I, it's because I trust in God. And I, I, I'm in tune with the spirit that's inside me. And he, and he lives inside you too. And sometimes it's not very happy, you know. So we need to cheer it up, cheer him up and let him know, hey, I know you're there. I know you're in control and it's all good. So question five, how does this process work to bring us peace? I don't get it. Waiting and doing this and that and being calm. And how, how does it arrive at a, into a peaceful situation? It has to do with the righteousness of God. OK, remember, none of us are righteous. None of us are righteous. God is righteous and he makes us righteous. See, that's a very big difference. Galatians 5, 5 says in the New Living Translation, but we who live by the spirit, and that's that inner man I was talking about a minute ago, wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised us. He's promised us. You know, we, we, that's the reason, uh, one of the things that Cynthia was talking about, about not needing to do this, all this sacrificing and all of that. Well, Jesus already sacrificed for us, didn't he? Didn't he die for us already? Was that not enough? You need to bring uh, that sacrifice of righteousness into your life so that we can have this peace. Isaiah 32, 17 to 18 says, and this righteousness will bring peace. See, when, when you know that you are right with God, that's what the righteousness is. That you deserve to be loved. That you deserve to be part of his kingdom. That even though you're not perfect, because none of us are, he has made you righteous through the Holy Spirit. And as he makes you righteous, he brings you peace. You see, that's what I'm trying to get to there. He's bringing you peace. It's not like, okay, I'm going to sit down and be peaceful. No, no, it doesn't work like that. We need God's righteousness. So as you feel his righteousness flowing over you and reminding you that he loves you more than anything else in the world, that there's nothing he would not do to take care of you, provide for you. Do you think he just he abandons us as we get older? No, he's probably there more than any than ever before. Just when you need him the most, that's when he's going to be there. 
So he says, and this righteousness will bring peace. Yes, it will bring quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in safety. Quietly at home. They will be at rest. Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful thing? Not a wonderful promise. So we need to tap into the righteousness of God through the Holy Spirit. And then he calms us down. But when we get so caught up in our activities in doing stuff and be, becoming active and, and trying to fix things, we get into a lot of trouble. So he wants to bring us rest. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be able to sit at home and be calm and peaceful and knowing that God is in control? And that even though we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next year, we know it'll all work out for the best because God has made us righteous. Not because we deserve it. No, not at all. Not because we're good people. No, that's not it either. It is because he loves us and we have decided to be part of his family. That's why he says, my people, we are God's people, okay? So we need to live like we are God's people. He is our father. We are his children. You will never outgrow God. He will always love you from the very moment that you, that you walked on this earth. So we are made righteous by the righteousness of God. It is God that makes us right before his throne. So you can come to God and tell God, you know, God, I'm, I, I, I'm taking on the righteousness that you have provided me. And, uh, and therefore, I'm asking you to listen to this prayer. Sometimes it requires a little bit of fasting, you know, and we're, we'll talk about that in the future. I do some fasting, by the way. I believe in that. Uh, there's spiritual fasting, you know, where you deny your, the flesh and you um, wait on the Lord. But there's also a health fasting where if you're if you're can't get rid of an illness of some kind or an injury uh, and you and you fast, uh, the body begins to heal itself. OK, but that's a direction that we will talk about another time. So when we are right with God and we're doing as well, we find a quiet and peaceful place. It is a process. When we say process, that means it takes a, it takes a while. It takes time. So when I get my students to come to school, it's not like when you get through this class, you're going to graduate. No, you're going to go to another class, another class, another process and so forth. You'll have some good times and bad times. You'll have good grades and bad grades. You know, one young lady was very upset with me because I gave her a B and she thought she deserved an A. And I said, well, you earned a B, so how can I give you an A, you know? So the point, but it's a process. It's a process. It takes time. Just like our relationship with God. The result is that we have peace in knowing that God knows what he's doing. And just because we don't know, it doesn't mean he doesn't know. Now, didn't the apostles have problems? You think that just because they, they were devoted to the things of the Lord, they didn't have any problems? Let me tell you, those of us that are involved with ministry have problems too. We really do. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse eight to ten in the New King James, it says, We are hard pressed on every side, but look what he says, but yet not crushed. We are perplexed. In other words, I'm kind of worried, you know, because wow, I don't know what happened to so and so over there. But not in despair. We're persecuted. You know what? We're not forsaken because God still loves me. Struck down, but we're not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So, yeah, they were having problems. 
And even Jesus would say, if you want to come after me, he says, you, you won't have any assurance about what you will eat or if you will eat and where you will sleep and where you will stay. So you've got to live by faith. Not too many people want to do that. So, yes, the apostles had plenty of problems, too, but they never let it get the best of them. They were Christians that figured out there's a purpose and an end to our suffering. They learned to be still and wait on the Lord when things went wrong. So instead of complaining, they asked, how will this make me a better person? How will this magnify the kingdom of God? I was having a discussion a little bit with uh, one of my nephew's uh, uh, his wife, you know, and uh, she was saying, if I look, went back into my life and I could change, because somebody put, put, somebody put this, this, this uh, an analogy, and they said, in, if you take this pill, you know, and she says, you can go back and be a six-year-old and start your life over. <laughs> and then if you take this pill, you can have a million dollars. That's a reference to the Matrix. Right? <laughs> We're not going to get into the Matrix right now. <laughs> but anyway, and so she, she saw that from a different angle. She said, the, the solution is easy because she said, I've had so many hard times. I suffered a lot. I was beaten. I was abused. I had so many troubles. But you know what? If I live my life over, I would not have my children. I would not have my husband. I would not have my relationship with God because I would have gone off in a different direction. So she says, so even the bad things that have happened to me have made me a better person. Made me a better person. I think I mentioned this before to you that when I was drafted in the military, I, 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 I gave this long elaborate prayer and in a very scenic location, you know, I went up in a hill someplace, you know, because they were just, I was already drafted, I was on the military already, but they were deciding where they were going to send me. And I was on my knees and I was praying to God, God, don't send me over to the war because, you know, I'm a non-combatant. I don't have any weapons and such, and I'm not going to carry any weapons. But I, I, I want to go because I want to serve, but I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'll die. So I prayed. And I feel really good after I prayer. I said, I guess this means I'm not going to go because the Lord has made me feel really good in here. Well, as you know how that turned out. <laughs> I went to the war anyway. But you know what? It was okay because I got to save some lives. I, there's people walking around this earth that I have never seen again that maybe had got married, had children and grandchildren that may never have done that if I had not been put there by God. See, I'm giving him the credit and the glory. Uh, I don't know how I managed to save that many people, to be honest with you. But if I didn't want to go there, but if I hadn't gone there, my life would be very different. So it made me a stronger person when I came back. I felt you know, like, because I always had about a hundred guys or more that I had to take care of during the war. And um, it, it was always hard, you know, because I was responsible for all of them. And I learned to be responsible for people at, in ministry, and I learned to be responsible for people in education as well. So that's what God was preparing me for, you see. So, yeah, the magic pill, I could not take the first one either, even though I didn't like doing that. And I didn't like getting sick. I got sprayed with Agent Orange and I got injured and all kinds of crazy things. But I would not change anything at all, you know, and I can honestly tell you that now. But we have a last question here. Wrap it up this morning. What should our attitude be in the midst of trouble as it, as it close, right? What should my attitude be when well, next time things go wrong? And guess what? Something is going to go wrong. 
had a, and I think I've mentioned this this verse before, and and uh, it was my my cousin's uh, husband was there, and I mentioned I said something is always going to be wrong, go wrong. He says you were right. When I got home, the 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 water pipes had burst, and they were spraying everywhere. And he said I wasn't ready for that. None of us are. So we have to adapt, don't we? Learn to adapt. Psalm 16, 8 to 11 says, I know the Lord is always with me. And I will not be shaken. Can you honestly say that? The Lord is always with me and I will not be shaken. In some variations it says, I will not be moved. For he's right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Living with God forever. That's a wonderful thing. Right now, we can't even approach God because we, uh, it says no, no human being has ever seen God and lived. But you know what? When we go to the next life, we will be more like Christ and we will not have this flesh that you're so used to. And I don't know how that's going to happen, but we're going to know each other too. So when you get to see your mom and dad and or your your family and you see them over there, you're going to say they don't look like them, but I know who they are. But remember that even Christ suffered much while on earth and he left as an example to follow. We look to the Lord for an anchor to establish us as we wait the storms of life out. And we need to have an attitude of expectation and faith that the Lord will eventually get us through and that he will save us. You see, God wants to be the hero in our story. He doesn't want you to be the hero. You're spoiling it all. Because you and I are not really superheroes. Everybody wants to be a superhero now, right? I've lost track of how many superheroes are out there nowadays. Uh, I think the kids, if you ask them, they know. But I grew, some of you grew up like like I, I did with just Superman and and Batman and possibly Spider-Man. That was that's about it. They got so many of them now. But God doesn't want us to be a superhero. He wants to be our superhero. And he wants to save us. He wants to rescue us. He wants to be the solution to the problem. He doesn't want you to fix everything because we're not that smart. And that's not an insult, that's a reality. None of us are smart enough to figure out everything that goes wrong. So in conclusion, our strength has always been to be still and to wait upon the Lord. Even when you do not understand how the process works, Remember, it was righteousness. God is righteous. Ask him for his righteousness so that he can pardon your iniquities and you can come before the throne and you don't have to feel bashful or ashamed because he loves you. He's just waiting for us to come to him with whatever problem you you're, you're have. And God has been there for those that wait upon him. Do you have problems that seem so insurmountable? I don't know how this is going to ever get fixed. I don't know what I'm going to do. No, you're not going to do nothing. You're not going to do anything. You are going to let God take charge. Are there obstacles that seem impossible to resolve? So wait upon the Lord and he will deliver you in your hour of need. Because that's how God operates, you know, and he he doesn't mind uh, being there for you and saving you in your time of need. 
Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the time that you've given us to get, be together as your people. For you are a faithful and loving God. You are a God that saves. Help us, Lord, to be calm, to be still, and to wait upon you, and to know that you will never forsake us. Because you are the Holy One. You are the one that saves people. You are the one that makes things better. Help us to trust in you, Lord, to believe in you as never before. And even though we've let ourselves down and we've let you down as well, we know that you will rise above that and you will pardon us and you will cover us with grace and fill us with righteousness. Forgive us now, Lord, be our strength and redeemer in all things and abide with us now and forever. Thank you for the brethren that were able to come today, Lord. May you bless them, a double portion of your blessing. Those that are still online and those that could not come for whatever reason, we pray they will come the next time. And so we want to just thank you for all of this and ask this in Christ's name.